good morning or good afternoon, wherever you are. It's, it's really good to have you join us um, for the next seminar in our virtual seminar series. Um, I'm really delighted this morning to have Jesse Poon uh, to deliver the seminar for, for this morning. Um, uh, some of you may already know, but I'll just uh, introduce uh, Jesse. She is currently Professor of Geography at University at Buffalo, New York um, University. And she's also uh, editor uh, of Environment and Planning A, um, as well as uh, currently the uh, a chair, is it, is it chairperson, um, Jesse, of Regional Studies Association. Yeah, so we're really pleased uh, to have her uh, with us, uh, even though she's, you know, kind of uh, shuttling in between continents and, and currently joining us uh, from Singapore uh, right now. So uh, I believe uh, Jessie has a slight change uh, in, her, in her title, um, but it will still be on looking at regulate geographies of regulatory issues, uh, particularly looking at the case of between US and Singapore regulations. So I will let uh, Jessie fill you in with, uh, with what she's going to say. Uh, and I believe uh, Alex is going to help us with the slides. So if, if Alex could share the slides on screen. As with most, uh, I think most of us are quite familiar with Zoom protocol these days, but um, uh, it would be great if everybody could just keep your mics uh, mute uh, during this time. Um, feel free to keep your videos uh, on or off depending on your internet connection or your, or your background. Um, but it's also uh, really nice and helpful to, uh, for the presenter, right? To present your faces rather than black squares if possible. Um, and please feel free to also note down your comments or questions in the chat and we will return to any questions that you have um, after the end of Jessie's uh, presentation. She will speak for about uh, 30 minutes uh, or so uh, before we open up for broader discussions and questions. So uh, over to you, Jessie, on geographies of financial regulation. Uh, thanks to Karen, Derek and the organizing committee for inviting me to this seminar. I've tweaked my title a little, as you can see, because I sent my abstract to Karen while I was on the train to New York City. And since then, I've had some opportunity to rethink some things about it. And um, I wanted to pull it all together under this broad topic of geographies of financial regulation. So Alex, can you move to the next slide? Okay, thank you. So let me begin with the following financial globalization paradox. Financial globalization in the past 20 years has been accompanied by regulation. Regulation would seem paradoxical if we accept the argument that financial globalization has been facilitated by neoliberal processes that promote, to quote David Harvey, individual entrepreneurial freedom and skills within an institutional framework of free markets, private property rights, and free trade. The role of the state, according to David Harvey, is to preserve such an institutional framework. Under this framework, globalization's dominant spatial imaginary has been one of the rolling back of the state, as well as legal privile uh, privileges from deregulation. So I, I just want to uh, first touch a little bit on sort of the current state of uh, sort of uh, practice amongst financial geographers in sort of uh, financial globalization. Uh, so first of all is the global financial networks of which uh, both Karen and Derek have, are major contributors to the theory here, which basically seeks to distinguish financial networks from um, global production networks in terms of geographies and actors. And as we all know, they identify the specific geographies in terms of um, world cities, as well as offshore centers, and then the major actors as um, advanced business services or ABS actors. Um, then there's a second stream of sort of literature on sort of financial globalization, and that would be the World City Networks uh, folks, which highlight intra firm control globally by mapping the interlocking networks of ABS HQs and their global, regional, and local offices. Then there is also a third stream of work on offshore centers and tax havens. Uh, which highlight the type of financial expertise that ABS intermediaries specialize in, namely the production of investment vehicles and global investment patterns in particular locations. So this includes setting up of offshore companies, tax planning, minimization of taxes, uh, even the purchase of real estate, yachts, financing of movies uh, in world cities. While geographers have been relatively active in producing a large body of work on financial globalization, there is little attention 
to the paradox that I had raised, namely that financial globalization and its crises have spawned more regulations and regulatory reforms, not less. Indeed, what is often overlooked is that finance is one of the most regulated industries. Can you move to the next uh, slide, Alex? So if you look at this slide over here, on the left, uh, the uh, George, Mason, George Mason University has compiled the number of restrictions from regulations in the Obama years. And this, of course, came in the aftermath of the financial crisis of 2008. Um, so from 2009 to 2016, you can see the number of uh, restrictions associated with these regulations and the Dodd-Frank Act, which is considered to be the most extensive regulatory uh, financial regulatory reform since the 1930s uh, has like 27,278 uh, uh, restrictions arising from these regulations. So if you look at the graph on the left, of all the regulations that were, that were sort of enacted uh, under the Obama administration, 74% of them were uh, related to Dr. Reng uh, and its uh, act uh, uh, basically uh, with the finance industry. So if you think about it, you know, of all the healthcare, labor, et cetera, even environmental regulations, finance has uh, basically made up the vast majority of these regulations. And so, so it is one of the most uh, regulated industries, um, uh, uh, you know, uh, across sectors. Uh, next, next slide. So we don't ha just have uh, sort of regulations in the hard form like the Dodd Frank Act, right? But we also have regulations of the softer form where you think about regulations in terms of principles and broader guidance. And of course, this is very much encapsulated in international standard setting bodies uh, such as BCBS, uh, IOSCO, the CPMI. And if you look at the chronology that I've, I've, I've kind of outlined out here, uh, several regulations have come up since the financial crisis as well, uh, at a time when we thought that financial globalization was also occurring alongside these regulatory requirements, right? In fact, if you look at the last row on testing, stress testing, that's very much a big part of what banks have to do now in the United States. And I might go into it later on about what this really requires, but it, 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 it is, uh, it is uh, kind of uh, the ideas are being shared between sort of the, these, uh, the, these, the, the bodies of, of standard setting as well as the more hard agencies that are involved in the, uh, in the, in the practice of regulation. Okay, next slide. So I think of geographies of regulation as being somewhat complex because the spaces are somewhat heterogeneous and complex. And that there are several approaches that we can think of uh, towards this geography of, uh, of regulation. The first of which is a state-centric approach, where you kind of think of, very simply put, the power of the state in setting uh, regulations. Uh, here, the state acquires what Chris Brenner has called a container quality, particularly in areas concerning taxation as part of a country's fiscal sovereignty. Modern concepts of state rights and duties are one reason why it has been difficult to regulate tax havens that have aggressively challenged OECD's harmful tax competition policy. Offshore jurisdictions have pursued tax minimization or tax evasion on the argument that taxation sovereignty gives them a competitive advantage against world cities. So in the Panama Papers, uh, may I move on to the next slide? Alex, yeah. So in the Panama Papers that I had uh, that published in Political Geography, uh, we showed that secrecy jurisdictions aren't just the work of ABS intermediaries in some sunny jurisdictions in the tropics, uh, but, uh, but, but they are also found in Wall City. So if you look at the flows, the pink flows and the blue flows, for instance, uh, which sort of tracks the intermediaries right down from the origin to the destination, uh, what you find uh, is that now it's becoming, I mean, as many of you know, and have, have, have also said in other papers that it's quite hard to distinguish between um, uh, sort of tax havens as well as sovereign states that have uh, fiscal sovereignty, for example. Uh, next slide, oh, before I do that, I just want to point out that on the bottom left picture, 
That is, uh, of course, uh, the the former prime minister of Iceland. So, so the very the very fact that politicians are charged with regulating, um, you know, gives you the sense of what's going on uh, in terms of uh, uh, how you regulate uh, in this globalization age. So, the next slide, please. So, another example of the state-centric approach is this paper that I published in the Annals. Um, of uh, the Association of American Geographers on uh, Mal the Malaysian state in uh, modernizing its Sharia legal institutions. So uh, what I did was to focus on the legal technology of scripts, mainly legal text guides and documents in the state's rescaling of Sharia regulatory framework from local to national level that privileges neoliberalism's notions of accountability, transparency, and risk. And in this case, they were very concerned about moral risk, of course, associated with Sharia in establishing property rights. The argument is that by creating national institutional layers that tackle Sharia moral risk uh, and, and uh, to construct these institutions around common law countries, mostly UK and USA legal institutions, uh, this could help Malaysia acquire a jurisdictional advantage over its Gulf counterparts. In a sense, this is not that different from tax havens construction of jurisdictional sovereignty, in this case, through the state's ability to engage in regulatory competition. The next slide, please. So a second approach is the business-led uh, sort of approach. Uh, and this is mostly, you mostly find it in uh, sort of neoclassical economics, uh, you know, rational choice theories kind of uh, approach, right? Uh, the one that I'm focusing on is much more on regulatory capture, which is this idea that um, ABS, the ABS uh, industry is able to project state regulatory power by capturing regulators and using their regulations to block rivals or to stunt competition. So the 2008 financial crisis is argued to be the result of regulatory capture where agencies um, task to monitor financial institutions ended up identifying with the banks and protecting its interests against the public instead. Um, a third approach is what I call the transgovernmental approach, uh, which originated in the constructivist uh, sort of uh, paradigm uh, in the business scholarship actually, which sees social networks and discursive activities as sources of norms. Uh, so regulations arise from these sort of normative behavior from convergence you know, of norms through social interactions, informational exchanges, uh, such as Dassons, who is not present today, but his work on uh, sort of the interlocking directorates on Sharia boards, right? So his whole premise of that paper was to talk about how uh, these directors on the boards internationally construct these norms of standards um, and then bring these standards and diffuse them throughout the world. Um, all three explanations suggest that we can think of regulatory spaces as varieties of regulatory regimes, following the idea of varieties of capitalism where regulatory regimes are not only complex, but uh, also assume and are manifested in many forms and scales. However, with the exception of the transgovernmental approach that presumes interlocking network patterns arise from microagentic activities, the micro macro integration of regulation and multi-scolarity underscoring the labor of regulation are often overlooked. So here I, I examine a fourth approach to understand the geographies of regulation and their varieties, namely regulatory capitalism. Can we move to the next slide? So let me quote uh, Levier Four, who summarized it as saying, when we, we say or write regulatory capitalism, we look beyond the state as a domestic political institution, and at the same time, make a theoretical argument about the relations between states and markets. This in turn helps to advance a constitutive interpretation of regulation, a perspective that focuses on the role of regulation in the continuing expansion, adaptation, and transformation of capitalism. And so the key word from this quote is really constitutive interpretation. Next slide, please. In effect, regulatory capitalism locates regulation as central to the functioning of the financial capitalist system. Uh, under Levy 4's 
constitutive interpretation. Regulation is a dynamic process that is constituted by state and firm actors and is therefore continually changing the character of capitalism. But I would also like to expand the term constitutive to include constitutive, process, uh, constitutive processes in the production of space and scale. Two points may be highlighted here. First, there are the constitutive processes of monitoring and enforcement, not just directing aspects of uh, regulation. These processes require the coordination of scale. Second, constitutive processes draw on multiplicity of authority by expanding bureaucratic agencies at the national level and by expanding the pool of regulatory compliance uh, professionals at the local level with the authority to monitor, enforce, and even punish. Together, both state bureaucratic and ABS actors do the work of regulating through their power to create and rehabilitate compliance systems. Attention to the design and practice of compliance systems has led to the development of new organizational capacity. The Dodd-Frank Act created many new government and bureaucratic agencies to monitor the financial industry. In my recent work on US and Singapore, and this is uh, where I guess my original uh, uh, title came from, the US Foreign Account Tax Compliance Act of FATCA, which monitors tax evasion, uh, gave authority to the Internal Revenue Authority, Justice Department, and Treasury Department in the monitoring of global finance, including tax evasion. In addition, the Office of Foreign Assets Control, or OFAC, which is uh, where I'm going to focus on, was created within the Treasury Department to monitor regulations associated with threat financing, mostly money laundering, uh, as well as US trade and political sanctions. US public agencies extra territorial regulatory reach relies on two instruments of discipline. First, the hegemony of the US dollar. Foreign financial institutions are compelled to remain in the US dollar orbit to finance trade. 90% of world trade is financed in US dollars. Second, the expansion of financial compliance professionals, uh, professionals role in supporting US regulations. As powerful as the US Treasury and Federal Reserve are in the global financial economy, their regulations are territorially restricted. So in that sense, uh, state framings have struggled with this tension between you know, sort of national and transnational. Reducing extra territorial spaces of regulatory power involves the creation of departments of compliance in financial institutions, which used to be front office work. These departments and their professionals now perform the work of monitoring and enforcement of financial activities from back office, resulting in intra-organizational changes. In effect, organizational space within firms and governments is transformed to do the work of monitoring. Compliance and its rules have become the main symbolic structure for measuring the success or failure of regulating. Moreover, the labor of regulation involves coordination of scale between ABS actors and the state, a tripartite model of collaboration between financial firms in Singapore, financial firms in the US, and both US, or I should say ABS firms, um, and both US and Singapore bureaucratic and forces. This involves considerable coordination of scale. For example, extra firm coordination nationally between ABS firms and their regulatory bureaucrats, inter-firm coordination transnationally between Singapore and US, um, and intra-firm coordination between front and back offices locally. So you're looking at three levels of skills at the firm, as well as um, the national and then the transnational. Um, these actors and their spaces of organization are responsible for interpreting both US as well as Singapore law and regulation. Take FATCA. Financial institutions both in US and Singapore must figure out when an individual is engaged in money laundry, tax evasion, or if the client's involved with an entity that is engaged in uh, terrorist financing. Once a violation has been identified, compliance professionals act as gatekeepers who diffuse regulatory and uh, legal values to financial institutions. While they exercise some agency in interpreting regulatory risks, uh, such as tax evasion and uh, versus money laundry. And may I add that in my interviews, yeah, I've interviewed more than 20 of these financial advisors. Um, 
uh, I think they don't actually see tax evasion as a serious problem. They see money laundry as definitely a crime. So there is some agency there in what constitutes uh, regulatory infractions, actually. So compliance professionals' exercise of discretionary power is also constrained to some extent by the transnational inter-firm relationships with U.S. banks. U.S. banks are strategic partners of OFAC bureaucrats in the gathering of regulatory risk information. So one interviewer declared that U.S. banks are eyes for OFAC. The principal mechanism for information gathering lies in symbolic structures and systems set up by compliance personnel within their firms. These systems entail extensive risk analysis. So think about um, one bank, which is one of the largest banks here in Singapore, um, having to go through a million transactions a day and trying to track regulate, uh, regulatory infections and risk uh, in those million um, uh, transactions. That's what they say. They go through over a million transactions a day and they, they have to perform these risk analysis to try and track um, these, uh, these possible infections. Um, and then to determine the kind of remediation solutions when uh, violations are detected. Uh, compliance reports, basically the whole regulate, the, the whole act of regulating is this discussive structure where you produce these reports. Uh, so this risk analysis, this tracking, this monitoring involving quite high powered technology like AIS systems, for example, uh, uh, basically are to produce these reports which then insulate uh, these companies from the force of law. Um, in effect, compliance has become a legal technology for meeting regulatory standards. Uh, if non-compliant is to be seen as committing a financial regulatory crime and financial firms are subjected banks, for instance, investment banks, as well as uh, 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 other investment financial institutions are subjected to a rehabilitation process of remediation by financial auditing firms. And this is a point that I'm gonna to come to right now, that regulatory work is actually performed by a range and array of professionals. It's not confined to one profession. So auditors do this, you know, accountants do this, and then lawyers do this. So it's really a, a very mixed diversified group uh, because the act of regulating is simply to produce these compliance and rehabilitation or remediation reports. Um, overall, this multi-scalar division of labor, maybe I should go to the next slide. Um, right, so I think I've already gone through these points. Sorry, guys, I forgot about this slide. Um, overall, this multi-scalar division of labor in the tripartite model underscores financial surveillance as a spatial tool for regulating, a tool for extraterritorializing and transnationalizing US FATCA and OFAC regulations. One interesting trend with compliance in the work of regulating is that this has seen the emergence of a group of service providers that specialize in regulatory risk. Uh, in particular, the big four accounting companies like Deloitte and KPNG, both of whom, uh, which I actually interview, have vertically integrated their operations by bringing in-house uh, regulatory work, uh, which legal advisors are finding hard to compete. In fact, the auditors are now claiming expertise on regulation and challenging their legal uh, the legal advisors uh, on this, that they are the ones who can do the work better than the legal advisors. So can I uh, go to the next slide? So if you look at this complaint, uh, by the partner, the senior partner of a law firm, he said, well, you can replace legal counsel with regulatory advisement. So you do not need to be credentialed as a lawyer to do legal work in taxation. Okay. Auditing firms are bringing financial work in-house, hiring their own lawyers and not externalizing financial legal matters to legal service providers. They also compete with lawyers by rebranding tax and financial advice as regulatory expertise. But regulatory advice involves the law, does it not? So, um, so one reason is that the work of regulating demands meticulous culling of financial data that auditors are best in uncovering. So I actually visited the department where they did this. So if, if a financial infraction has been found, you know, violation of some uh, regulation, uh, 
these auditors have the power to go into the company and uh, basically you know, dismantle their entire computer systems to get at trails of emails and trails of data uh, in order to formulate a solution for rehabilitation. This is, these are for small infractions, bigger infractions you get fined uh, very seriously by the authorities. Um, so auditors work with compliance professionals in remediation, wielding power in determination determination of a firm's compliance of regulations. They are the face of FATCA enforcers at the local level. Hence, we see the rise of a subsector of ABS actors involved in the work of regulating. Next slide. So this is a new phase of uh, regulatory work. You have this new uh, emergence of new actors. Um, and um, this company, for instance, that I, I went to, um, uh, look at as well as interview, uh, most of the professionals working in this company were all uh, trained in accountancy or trained in um, uh, auditing, uh, no lawyers, for instance, but, you know, as it were, claiming the work of regulating and claiming the work of legal advice in this case. Um, so, uh, so now what we have is a situation where regulatory work is really not so neatly categorized anymore. I mean, we can't really study regulatory work as under the purview of say, law professionals or legal firms or legal advisors, you know, tax advisement is under these other categories. Uh, you, you now actually uh, have this uh, sort of, it's more difficult to actually uh, say who is regulating and who is not regulating in terms of a particular group. You know, uh, many of the ABS actors are not entering this arena and claiming expertise on it. So um, I think uh, the one of the, I think the law it was that I, I interviewed, I'm not supposed to reveal, you know, I, I shouldn't say it. So I should say another another company that I, I, I had interviewed uh, said that their uh, compliance and regulatory department is now as large as the mergers and acquisition department. And the revenues that they brought in in the last few years have been as large as the revenues of MAA. So this is the kind of work uh, that is now gaining uh, sort of traction in these companies. Where am I on time? Um, not bad. Okay. So um, next slide, I'm coming to my conclusion. Okay. So the objective of my talk is to invite more work on political economy in global finance. In today's case, I focused on financial regulation on the premise that regulations are not going to go away. What I've shown in regulatory capitalism is the emergence of new specializations in ABS firms. Firm and state's organizational capacity are being transformed through multi-scalar division of labor. Geographies of regulation offer fertile ground for theorizing and undertaking empirical work on regime complexity in varieties of regulatory uh, regimes. So I'm done. Thank you. Any questions? Thank you very much, Jesse. And that's just brilliant timekeeping. I was going to tell you, you have, you know, five more minutes, but you know, I, I think that's, that's a fantastic uh, a point to stop as well. I think you've raised a lot of really intriguing, you know, observations from, um, uh, not just your your uh, kind of fieldwork interviews that you brought up, um, field observations, but also I mean putting together the different strands of literatures um, uh, and, and and how different kind of subfields have approached the issue of regulation. So let let's see um, whether uh, the uh, audience or the participants have more comments or questions. So we will welcome questions, but if you have a comment um, to raise, that that would be very welcome as well. Uh, please feel free to type it out in the chat if you want to, or you could uh, just uh, write Q and I will invite you to unmute yourself uh, and, and speak. So maybe give people a, a minute or so to um, type things out or, or figure out their thoughts. Uh, I'm, I'm seeing one question perhaps from Michael Grote because I look at the question mark, so I presume you have a, is that a question for me? Or is it a comment? Yeah, I was wondering whether it's a question or a comment, but um, Michael, please uh, feel free to feel free to uh, say something if you wish. Uh, yeah. So, so thanks a lot, Jesse, for for for, for this uh, um, 
very interesting and, and thought-provoking uh, talk. So the, um, I was wondering uh, whether the, uh, the more power, more regulation to the state uh, also would go hand in hand with more lobbying activities, right? And uh, so the, the more power the state has, the, the more, uh, the higher the benefits would be for, for lobbying um, uh, in your favor. Did, did you see anything like this? So the idea of lobbying would be very strong in um, states, uh, in the regulatory capture theory, you know. Um, for them, uh, regulations, you know, regulations, if you problematize it, you know, uh, a lot of uh, the general conventional wisdom is that regulations are bad because it adds cost to the industry, right? But in actual fact, a lot of regulations are good for industry because they protect the industry is, is what you're saying uh, through lobbying, for example, or through special interest influence, for instance. And so uh, the regulatory capture literature would say that regulations uh, uh, by nature uh, captured by these industrial actors or industry actors, and they have input. So they would have written their interest into some of these regulations, uh, like it or not. So if you look at it from that regulatory capture point of view, then uh, yeah, these regulations uh, are not necessarily costly because they've been written to benefit um, the industry itself. Uh, so uh, the question is whether some of these harder forms of regulations are backed by legislation, how much of that has um, industry influence on it. So uh, I know that I'm just reading that um, Derek has talked about some Mary Streep, Meryl Streep um, movie. Uh, so I would, I would, I would add that uh, actually the, the video that I, I watched this morning was um, the, the Apple's Tim Cook being grilled uh, by Congress, right, uh, for tax evasion. Of course, you know, uh, Congress is basically grilling him about uh, putting his uh, capital in Ireland, for instance, you know, and asking him if, very aggressively if he was trying to evade taxes in, in the U.S. And his reply was, I mean, so that, that, that case was simply, he says, we have no special you know, influence on tax policies in the U.S. or we would have gotten the tax down. But, but for him, his answer was simply this was international business that he's put his uh, capital abroad because he has uh, taxation revenues are actually a very, very small part of his total cost. That it's really labor costs as well as product development. That's really the bigger part of his cost. And he shifts his capital uh, abroad in order to expand business. So that, that's, his, that's his thing. But, but his reply would be, I didn't, I didn't lobby to have these kinds of tax rates in the US. You know, I, if I could have uh, influenced the US tax policies, I would have brought it down to a much lower level, you know, so. Thanks for that, Jesse. Um, if I just go down the list of people who indicated questions, uh, can we go to uh, Derek and then Jikon and then Chris? So Derek, please. Hello, everyone. Thank you. Thank you, Karen. Thank you, Jesse, for a stimulating talk. I have a question about uh, the role of big four companies in these services uh, from based on your research. Uh, do you think it has changed in this area of regulatory compliance over the last decade or since the crisis? Uh, and the second question is on the role of technology, regulatory technology. It has your research uncovered any, anything in terms of the, the, the role of RegTech in this area. So these are my two uh, questions. Thank you. So the discovery, I think the big four is really interesting and I would like, I'm trying to follow them as closely as I can, but you know, sometimes it's very difficult to get access to them. So I happen to have a student working there. And so he provided some access to um, uh, a lot of the, the, the personnel there. Um, and so got, I got very deep insight and got to visit. And actually, uh, I had a good luck, you know, some one compliance director showed me all the trade secrets, you know, in terms of the, uh, how they actually built their risk models, you know, there's hundreds of variables, it was quite impressive, you know, so, so, and she said, you can read it now for 15 or 20 minutes. And then after that, I'm going to have to lock it back in my safe, right. So, so I, I got to actually look at that secret document and to, to confirm, for example, the kinds of risk modeling that they were doing, you know, and the algorithms they were, they were using. But, but, but the, to, to answer your first question, 
what I am seeing uh, is that, uh, so I was looking at the revenue of the big four uh, law companies in Singapore and the big four uh, sort of these accounting and auditing companies in Singapore, right? These auditing companies in the, uh, you know, and the, there's no comparison. The, the law companies are very small, the big four. You know, so so obviously, you know, that's where the 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 interviewer was complaining that they are getting smaller and smaller. And any of you know recruiting uh, big shot lawyers to do tax advising and all that is no longer so lucrative because they're all joining um, the lawyers or KPMG. So that's sort of uh, bringing some of this what used to be legal advisement work. They're bringing it in house and vertically integrating, and you know now part of the advisement involves legal advisement as well. So they not only bring in lawyers, so they're integrating uh, horizontally as well with their compliance units with their auditors. So it's a one-stop kind of uh, 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 thing for you know. So if you you want to learn about regulatory risk, uh, come to us. It's a one-stop thing. We can do everything from financial crime to any form of regulation, right? So, and then the premier's company that I showed you, they, they gave me permission to reveal. So I said, okay, I'm going to show them to you. Um, that, that one is completely uh, regulatory. So, so, so what is interesting is that they advise a lot of tax, uh, a lot of uh, haven-like kind of companies as well that want to know how much of their activities are causing them headache, for example, uh, when it comes to evading regulation and all that stuff. And, and so some of their stories are pretty funny, like, um, but, but, but at the end of the day, uh, they, they, their, their work is and quite lucrative as well. It's all on regulatory risk. So, and then the second question on uh, technology. So I think the technology part, the part where I think they're most worried about are these transactions uh, on uh, sort of online and these transactions sort of um, ATM machines and things like that as well, where they said there's been a lot of uh, security breaches and then, you know, in turn that flout some of the regulatory rules on security. So, so technology security and all that. So from where I, uh, my, my, from what I, I understand, uh, uh, they are turning to AI, but AI itself has a lot of problems uh, in flagging these risks, right? I mean, so at the end of the day, maybe it's a person I talked to because he was at the end of the day, a lawyer, you know, uh, controlling the compliance department. Uh, he says, well, all these accountants, they come with their quantitative risk models and they have all these wonderful fancy statistics and these values and great, you know, at the end of the day, I look at ABC and I said, low risk, high risk, but I still have to make a qualitative judgment. And so for him, a lot of these technology types of regulations are quantifiable, but he still has to make a, qualitative judgment as to whether a particular security attached to a technology has been breached. Thank you, Jesse, uh, for that uh, reply. Uh, I think next, can we get to uh, Jikon Lai for a uh, comment slash question, I think. Thanks, Karen. Uh, thanks, Jesse, for that presentation. I really enjoyed it. Um, I remember watching or hearing your presentation uh, on a, I think, uh, at a seminar in Beijing that was about two years ago now, I suppose. And I get that this is sort of an extension of the work that you had done earlier. Um, this is just a reaction to what you were saying, uh, uh, in particular to that co quotation you had from the lawyer uh, and how he was griping about, uh, I guess, the loss of his bread basket. But I wonder whether, you know, he, he's making a... Uh, a false distinction, right? That the work that you're analyzing at the moment is really about compliance rather than regulation. So in a way, you know, for bank or financial institutions that are focusing on compliance, you don't really care about the lawyer because you don't, you're not looking at tabula rasa, you don't need legal advice. You just wanna know what you can do to meet the requirements that have been imposed upon you. And for a long while now, these, are, these sorts of operational um, advice have typically come from management consultancies, right? So in a sense, I'm, I'm seeing this sort of uh, a phenomenon that you're looking at as a continuation of what's been going on in business circles for a very long time in that sense. Um, 
I, I, so I just wonder whether this, you know, whether that distinction is sort of, in, you know, whether the lawyer's distinction was kind of misguided, but obviously ex, ex, uh, understandable given his particular profession. But secondly, I also wonder whether that's true. As, uh, this, this, this focus on compliance is really true, right? In that banks don't really care about the enforcement bit or the regulatory bit. They just want to do what they have to do to get the government officers off their back. So they'll, you know, if, if the government officer says X, Y, Z, they'll do X, Y, Z uh, and just move on. They don't really care whether it addresses the real fatkaya concerns, whether it addresses money laundering concerns. They just want to comply and focus on where their real business is. And I wonder if that's that's also your um, uh, your reading of, of the industry, I guess. Well, I'll answer the second question first, because obviously many of them do not like to advise on tax evasion. Um, they think that tax evasion may be morally ambiguous, but not a criminal <coughs> problem. So, so, um, so, uh, so in that sense, if, if you're asking me, they are far more committed to regulatory risk of money laundering. That they see as a very big problem. So, so, so I, I, I think even without FATCA, um, money laundry for them, uh, uh, you know, it, it has reputational effects on the bank too. So, so I think that um, I, I, where, where I seem to run into more resistance when it comes to regulatory risk associated with tax evasion is, is that they're saying, well, okay, so it's morally ambiguous, but, but, but you, know, you know, you can look at it from a wealth management point of view too. Um, and then on the other one, um, you know, the regulatory capitalism literature is kind of interesting in the sense that uh, what they've observed is, and, and if you look at the Bureau of Business Labor Statistics, I've looked at sort of the workers, you know, uh, expansion of workers, compliance work has actually increased. The number of workers in the last 20 years, we use PUMS data and all, um, uh, combined with BLS data, um, the professionals, uh, involved in compliance have actually increased. And one of their main contention is that law is now working through compliance. I mean, you can't actually say that compliance has no law in it. It does, you know, because it does come to some interpretation of the regulation itself. But what we have is specifically, uh, uh, the question is uh, when you, you decide that regulatory work or regulating uh, is simply uh, monitoring and enforcement, then, then, then what it is, is that the uh, work of regulating itself, uh, compliance substitutes for it, you know, because so, 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 so uh, I get what you say, because if you flout a certain regulation, you can get fined. I mean, quite seriously in Singapore. I mean, I mean, the entire, I think I, I did this at the seminar two years ago, the entire one IMG scandal or your UBS scandal or your Bank of Paris uh, scandal or even HSBC scandals. These were all very serious regulatory risk uh, infractions which resulted in millions of dollars of fines. So, so they are not small infractions. Um, and so banks are very serious about it. But what, what I think is quite interesting is that compliance of 20 years ago was an important work. So, you know, financial geographers never focused on them because we were much more interested in investment bankers and what they do and things like that, accountants, what they do. But seriously, uh, they, they move right now to back office as uh, basically an exercise of control, whereas in the front office, they never really had that kind of control. So, so the rise of uh, compliance work is now in some ways substituting for the kind of legal work um, uh, to putting in place the systems that seem to look legal, right? So if you put these reports in, so for example, if you, you know, you have a small infraction in tax evasion, for instance, what happens? Well, then you go for rehabilitation and remediation. So the auditors then come around and say, you got to do X, Y, Z, like stress testing like that. You know, stress testing in the US, for example, my students are doing it. So I also know about it because they gave me a lot of insights. Um, you got to put in, in place these plans and these scenarios. What if there's COVID? And then uh, what happens to your capital requirement? What happens if all the loans default? If COVID, there's a pandemic, what happens if the G GDP falls by 3%? You know? So they have to produce these reports that then count for complying with the regulation, right? And, and, and what happens if the report falls short? 
there's a shaming exercise going on. Your name, your bank gets published in Wall Street Journal. You know, bank Jesse did not pass the stress test. And that is um, this shaming exercise, you know, it's used also in tax minimization types of policies to shame countries that, that, that do this, right? So they use uh, a series of tools, um, not just fines um, to get the regulation going. Yeah, I hope that, I hope that answers your question, Jikon, and um, uh, really interesting observation as well, trying to think about regulation and compliance and, and how these aspects kind of interrelate. Um, I think the next up is uh, Chris. You have a question, I believe. Hi, Chris yeah, thank, Hi. thanks, Jesse. That was really, really very interesting. Um, I was just reflecting on the latter part of your title, the rise of regulatory capitalism. And, and it, it seems obvious there's something interesting going on here about the relationship between the state and, and finance capital. But I, I guess I'm, I just wanted you to maybe expand on this notion. Why is this about capitalism? It, you, there's obviously a lot of labor, maybe new labor happening, new work going on. Is it, but is it productive work? Or is it just a matter of maybe slicing up, you know, bits of, of the, the rent that's collected at some point in this um, finance, you know, financial chain? Um, is this a is this is this about competitive dynamics between firms? Is is it is there something about privatization of, of regulation going on? So I, I don't I don't know, uh, but I'm just kind of wondering if you could expand a little bit more on on why this is a rise of a particular kind of capitalism. Thanks very much. Uh, I only applied it to um, compliance work, but there's many other areas of uh, sort of regulation that I haven't explored. So I'm proposing. And then, you know, if people, uh, more work in this area, right? But, but is it productive work? Um, you know, it's kind of an interesting question because I didn't think so when I started it. I did not know compliance was very productive work. I just thought, huh, compliance, you know, uh, surely it can't be very productive. It's just regulation, but it's turned out to be quite important. Uh, in, you know, so, so um, why, why is that the case? Um, well, just, in some of my ethnographic work, in one bank, for instance, uh, the the um, basically the vice president would not hire, you know, because of the pandemic, right? So he said hiring freeze, except when it comes to regulatory work. If it's regulatory work, we will hire. You know, if it's all other aspects of you know work we're not gonna hire. So this bank is a Malaysian bank, for example, so uh, operating in Singapore. And part of the reason is because, uh, you know, compliance work is not assumed some kind of a, a, a sort of a importance because the banks are, you know, it seems to have such a reputational sort of concern for, it's such a reputational concern for the banks um, that, that, that this has become somewhat important on their list of priorities, right? Is it, so, so is it productive work? Uh, if you ask all of those uh, folks who do investment vehicles and pr to protect, you know, sort of uh, companies in offshore uh, jurisdictions, they all say, no, it's not very productive. We hate compliance and we hate regulation, right? Um, so, so from that perspective, this is all terrible stuff that's going on. Uh, but, but then if you look at, it from uh, sort of the effect of dot frank for instance, has it dampened the financial industry? Has it dampened financial globalization? Not really. So, um, so the stock market's still busting get to the seams in the United States. And I mean, I thought I'm just waiting for market correction, you know, on my 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 pension, and it's not happened. I'm very happy, of course, for myself, but but at the same time, I'm going, I thought you know there would be some market correction at some time, but but I think these regulations that you have in place, you know, I I I I, I, I do not think uh, they have dampened the market the way so so maybe uh, new class neoclassical economists would would say that you know regulation is bad, it's going to cost the industry, da, 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 and stuff like that, right? So, so it's not clear to me that's the case. But what it does do is perhaps transform the character of capitalism. You know, so, so capitalism, not truly as free markets, you know, uh, but, you know, sort of, uh, so I haven't quite 
come to some point as to what character this is, you know, so what change this imposes on the character. I'd be very happy uh, if you could share ideas with me. So, thank you. Thanks for that question, uh, Chris. Um, I think we do have a kind of a comment slash question from James. Kamilari, do you want to uh, repeat your, your question, James? Yes, no, okay. it was just um yep. it was just a simple observation based on my time in the big four um not that long ago. Just about the the agency that they have over regulatory over the construction of the regulatory frameworks. Right. Um and it was a particularly telling anecdote from a staff conference, a staff uh sem a staff uh, meeting where they actually do talk actively with the people in the in government on the um, on the construction of legal frameworks, and I was wondering if you encountered it or heard any such things going on in your research as well. Uh, I think there is no doubt that the industry <laughs> uh, tries to influence regulations. I mean, I think there is some truth in regulatory capture. The question is how much, you know, and, and to what extent, right? Uh, uh, if you ask the same lawyer who is griping, he said, obviously we can't do some of the work they're doing, not because we don't know the legal principles, but because some of these regulations are crafted by the auditors who are then now doing the remedial work. So, mm. so, so, uh, so uh, that there is that 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 feeling that the lawyers are being sort of pushed out because they couldn't influence these regulations, um, and so these regulations that have been influenced by the other sort of auditors and accountants uh, now favor uh, how they uh, propose solutions to solve these regulations, right? So, so yeah, they draft I mean, it, yeah, yeah, mm. yeah. So, I mean, I I, I think. I'm not yet theoretically, you know, I've not come to a theoretical position where I could say that you could abandon the state-centric um, version of, of, of uh, explaining what's going on in terms of regulation. I think what the state-centric model of uh, what you're, you're talking about, Chris, is just not allowing me to uh, look at scale and multi-scalar sort of situation. So, so no, because it, 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 it still you know, struggles with this tension of transnationalizing some of its regulations. So, so but, but it does have um, quite a lot of um, stuff in there that I think is still very useful, so. Thank you. Thank you so much for your presentation as well. I really enjoyed it, thank you. Thank you. Thank you, James. Uh, I see there's a comment from Duncan in the chat to say that social studies of finance scholars argue that instruments and markets that are made, right, they don't pop out of nowhere. And this helps explain the deregulation or re-regulation dynamic. That all these new instruments need to be made. They need rules and standards and so on. So in this capacity, the state is acting to coordinate these uh, finance capitals, although the state has other roles as well. So I uh, just wonder, do you have any kind of response or comment to this, Jesse? Uh, right. Um, I, I, I think I think it's fair to say that. I mean, I think the, the 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 for me the purpose today is to try and lay out maybe some of the problems and perhaps point to the fact that there are all these issues surrounding uh, regulation in financial capitalism. Uh, how do we go about thinking about it? There are all these approaches out there, uh, but in effect, it's all very complex. I mean, there's regime complexity. How do we put these? different complex spaces together as a framework, right? So, and then, then we draw up on micro processes of, explana uh, of explanations where you're looking at sort of these actors that are influencing the state, uh, uh, but also the state as well. I mean, the state has some coercive power. It's not completely surrendering itself to, to, to the uh, actors uh, too, because it also, uh, gets pulled in different directions from other industries and other actors. So, so I think I think it's a fair comment. You know, I certainly uh, don't disagree. So. 
Fantastic. Thank you, Jesse, uh, for, for responding to that. Um, I'm just keeping an eye on the time. I think this is probably also a good time to, you know, to, to wrap up and, and thank Jesse for stimulating right, such, such interesting observations. And I think this is something that um, not just, Jess, uh, not just we'll just look forward to uh, Jesse's kind of uh, ongoing and forthcoming work uh, coming out of this, but I think also stimulating many of us to think about regulatory capitalism um, and the work Right. What kind of regulatory work is being done right, across different state and non-state actors in, in new ways in the coming years. So thank you very much, Jesse, for, uh, for, for kicking uh, uh, that off uh, for us. Um, over in uh, the next uh, couple of minutes, we're going to still keep the chat window open. Um, there is a link in the chat window. Uh, if you have another 10, 15 minutes to spare, uh, we would very much welcome you to join us for an informal chat, you know, just like we would after a seminar session. I think many of us miss those kinds of hanging out and, and, and chatting. So if you have a little bit of time left, um, please do join us over there. Um, and also uh, keep an eye out for uh, our next uh, uh, seminar series that's also uh, coming up. Um, uh, it'll be on our FinGeo website as well as on the RSA uh, website to register. So uh, thank you very much for, for joining us uh, today and we look forward to seeing you at the next few seminars as well.